if in business you want to do the process right, it almost has nothing to do with money. It has to do with doing it right. And if you do it right, then the money comes. Right. So I've never been that guy about the last nickel. I've always been about future business and future relationships. And let's get more business booked and let's make more people happy. Thank you so much for coming on today, John. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. I think it's going to be a great one, especially for the audience listening here. For the, the one or two people in the audience who don't know who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself and your centers. I wasn't exactly born into it, but I was almost 12. My kids have an advantage because they were born into it, and so am okay. I. So my dad built the first bowling center when I, in 1960. Do the math, you'll see how old I am. I loved every minute of going to work with my dad. We always say he invited, he invented, take your kid to work, take your son to work day. Right. Uh, I was putting red quarters in the pinball machine way back when, and then we'd take them out and use them again. But I loved every minute of the, especially the activity. There was a Broadway show that had a song, This Joint is Jumping, and I still hum it on a crazy busy day. And when I lose that enthusiasm for it, I know it's time to hang my hat up. Sure. A guy that's been doing this since 1971. We've had a dozen bowling centers. We currently run five in two states. It's less stressful for me now because I, I've learned to empower other people. Started with my kids and their team. And when you can trust the judgment that you have in selecting those who can represent you well, you could sleep at night. And that's really where I'm at right at the moment. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, to be able to be not worried about it 24-7 with five different centers is a testament to your uh, I worry about it, I, but <laughs> I know that the first line will usually do the right thing. That comes from lots of time, lots of examples, lots of, hey, I'm glad you handled the problem. Next time, do it this way always back the decision for the most part, unless it's a really dumb one, but you know, we're past that. Right. Uh, and then you use each as a learning, as a teaching moment, simple right. as that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why don't we hop into that a little bit? Because I think that's a really pressing issue for the industry today is passing the torch to the next generation. There's big boom of proprietors that started in the sixties. And now a lot of them are getting that age where the kids are starting to take over. Do you have any advice or thoughts on the best way to go about that? I think your some years in the past have been waves of people leaving. I just I want to talk about our core values because that has something to do with passing it on. We very simple: keep it clean, keep it friendly, keep it professional. And if you subscribe to those, and they're simple, it's a simple message, but it's very profound if it's executed right. So, what does that mean? Got to keep the bathrooms clean first thing. Got to be professional got to be friendly, got to be consistent. It depends on who our customers are, right? You want consistent food for the recreational people. You want consistent lanes for the league people. So unfortunate, my son really runs most of it. He subscribes to those values. He passes them on to the others. My daughter is involved to a lesser degree, same value system. My granddaughter's a great party hostess. It's measured by how much money she makes. I should be the party hostess. She should run the show. <laughs> but, you know, she keeps it friendly. She makes sure the orders are there and it trickles down. Mm -hmm. And I, I marvel now. This is four generations from my father, right? right? And this kid is sitting at the table and saying, I didn't like how to handle the situation. <laughs> that might have been her boss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's okay. My father taught her well, though she never met him. Right. It's in the blood. Yes. And so then I guess. So, so once you have the core values done, you could pass it on. I mean, you can't have this conversation without talking about the zillion pound gorilla in the room. And some people have opted to move on by selling to Bolera. Not what I want to do. I'm happy my kids are involved. Probably if I was a 75-year-old without kids involved, selling it to a young guy like you or to a big group like that would be an option. Right. Not anything I want to do. I want to pass it on. I want them to fill that box, that, those four walls with whatever 
is necessary to keep customers coming in. Dynamic changes all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you're saying really, if you have the core values, then everything kind of flows back up to that and you'll have kind of a shared mission and a lot of it takes care of itself. Yeah. I don't know what you call that in the real world. I just say, let's do it right or not do it at all. Yeah. Yeah. Core values. Uh, yeah. That, that sounds exactly right. What about as far as if you don't want to get into this, so we don't have to, but as far as the transferring ownership, do you offer any pieces of it or is it something handed down the road or do you have any thoughts on what that looks like? Since it's a family business, that's where the, that's where that part's going. But from the, from us as employers, I want, I, I want my employees to have good benefits. I want them to be taken care of healthcare to be affordable, which is crazy to, to that end. We went to a PEO, which is an, a, a professional employment organization, which means okay. we work for a third party. And we do that so that we could secure benefits more cheaply with a uh, more dynamic set of benefits as far as healthcare, which changes with five or six companies like we've had through the years. Right. Every two months we were negotiating healthcare. So finding a way to just do it once a year allows us to spend our time more valuably. Uh, besides that, we match four percent for a 401k so anyone and we probably have more we break the rules when it comes to how many full-time employees should you have yeah. we have a ton of them and i'm happy our yeah. payroll costs are high our turnover is low yeah the quality staff member that we have who stays is phenomenal i'm in awe of them and i want them to have something so you might be a porter and you might put 10 years in and you might have $8,200 in a, an account that you wouldn't have had. Right. Depending mm -hmm. on the stock market. Could have, yeah. Four years ago, it was 16000 But right. But the concept is they feel they, they have a sense of ownership. Yeah. And part of that core value is we're, we're family, but you're extended family to your livelihood. Run it mm -hmm. like it's yours. Yeah. And when I sit with the people, especially newer ones, because I think fresh eyes are really great, I'll say, okay, if you had my job, what's the first thing you would do? And one woman said to me in one of the places that was relatively new to us, I get rid of the toxic employees. Mm -hmm. And I said, toxic? Let me think about it. Who's toxic? And there were two. And mm -hmm. we kissed them goodbye eventually. And we were better for it. So fresh eyes and old ears. If you listen, you might learn something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially the people who are in there every day, right? They see it all. But I like that they, they feel like they're taken care of. Even if you said it's eighty two hundred dollars over the course of years, they still have the ability to do that. They feel like you care. But if you live paycheck to paycheck, that's mm -hmm. a windfall. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it means a lot to them. Yeah, tell it a little bit more, if you will, just maybe about some of the progression of having the different centers. It says you, it sounds like you went from 12 down to five. Is it just a yeah, matter of... We owned a total of four. We've never run more than six. But okay. My dad built the first place in Brooklyn. We bought the other large one on the other side of Brooklyn in 1979. We bought the Gil Hodges Lanes. Gil Hodges was, is now in the Hall of Fame, long deceased. The old guard of bowling proprietors all got along. They competed, worked collectively. My dad was a house builder. He put the shovel in the ground three or four months after they did the same at Gil Hodges Lanes. Mm. My father opened the doors long, while they were still building Gil Hodges Lanes. Oh, wow. Gil and his partner, Dr. Terranova, dear friend of ours, came to visit. My father showed them how to coordinate subcontractors, and he got them opened early. Go back, turn the clock 19 years. Gil was gone for seven years, died suddenly in 1972. And Doc went to my father and said, I want the boys, my brother and I, to buy us out. So that was... Okay. It was really, we never really looked, but because we were the younger ones and my dad's contemporaries were getting tired. We were the natural people. We, we made some clunky, some bad deals along the sure. way, and we learned from them. And I love real estate. I love marketing. And if you market the community right, you do well. After COVID, 
we had a really bad situation at one of our bowling centers on Long Island, and we made the decision to sell it and sell it for real estate. And it was it was tough. Yeah. And we've done it that a few times, but if the if we can't get people to bowl, if we can, if the neighborhood is dry, and that in the urban communities it's like people left Brooklyn to go to Staten Island, then they went to New Jersey. So yeah. they're going to make the trip back. So right. when it's over and COVID just did our Farmingdale lanes in and we, we just didn't see a way other than, I didn't want to cut it in half. We had a proposal to build out a fancy family entertainment complex, which would have meant a deeper investment. And in those yeah. times, we weren't sure if, if that would work. So right. we all that in 2022 was a great year for everybody, especially yeah. us. So, so that was that's the journey. You should always buy things for the right reason. You should always be able to take a risk, but you want to mitigate that risk with demographic things that you would do and just see what the whole community is all about. And for the most part, we've hit it right. Yeah, absolutely. So. Do you have any tips or thoughts on finding a deal or structuring a deal potentially since you've done hard a bunch? To, hard to do with that big gorilla out there, like a vacuum cleaner. Yeah, so, <laughs> they find them. There, I've often used the brokerage firm, Sandy Hansel and Associates. Okay, yeah. Uh, I don't know who else is out there. There's another broker out there. And not everyone wants to sell to the larger company. They right. want to keep the way they operate business the same. They're, we're we're very traditional with a flair for the contemporary. We're building our second arcade. We anticipate building other arcades. We have two food and beverage managers to bring that up. We do more and more catering than we ever have done before. So we see where it's going, and I'm not quite ready to abandon those nice people who bowl every week. Yeah. Yeah, why would you? Um, yeah, okay. That's mm -hmm. sort of what that's where I, my comfort level is. Yeah. So you typically go for the slightly larger center as far as you, historically what your targets were for acquisition and you're competing yeah. against the big guy. Through the years, 68 or 64. Oh, wow. 56 and a whole bunch of 48s. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you go 48. Two forties, a thirty-four, and a thirty-two. Okay. And and the thirty-four lane one is the one in Rockville Center, Long Island. It's where we. It's the closest to our home, so that's home base, and it's easy to fill. And I always say to everyone, but at Gil Hodges Lanes, we have the other side to fill, and the other thirty floor. What are we doing? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, on the waiting list, you need another thirty-four lanes. To right. Fill. That's huge. That's big. You know, there's nothing, if in business, you want to do the process right, it almost has nothing to do with money. It has to do with doing it right. And if you do it right, then the money comes. Right. So I've never been that guy about the last nickel. I've always been about future business and future relationships. And let's get more business booked and let's make more people happy. Right. Yeah. If you take care of the people, you do it right. Then the business tends to take care of itself for the most part. Let's jump in a little bit too, more into the two things that you just talked about is the uh, the gaming and the restaurants, because I, I don't, I think it, I'm sure it's not a new foray for you, but it seems to be more of an emphasis, I'd say, for you and a lot of the industry. Can you talk a little bit about that transition into that? So our world included leasing out snack bars. And we had one Greek family that ran the Maple Lane snack bar in Brooklyn for almost 40 years. And it was a Greek diner inside of 48 Lane Bowling Center. It's pretty cool. But it helped us with early leagues because you can come and have dinner on real live plates, you know, food taken out of that was cooked in an oven that was in a steam table. So it was, right. you know, we always thought about making sure the food was good. As time went on, we saw everything the family entertainment centers were doing. And we built two commercial kitchens out of the five that are left. and. We make sure that we, I shouldn't say we make sure, we, we do the best we can to keep things consistent. So we start with the food and beverage manager. We start with training. We continue it with menus and recipes and pictures. This is what it should look like on the plate. Yeah. 
want it to look good. It doesn't have to be from the Waldorf, but it certainly mm -hmm. should have a nice piece of wax paper that might be plaid, might have yes. a logo on it. With, have you ever been to Ford's Garage? It's no. a pub type place, big in Florida. Okay. And they, it's a derivative of the Ford Motor Company. I don't know how they did it. They probably got licensed. So the hamburgers come with the Ford Motor Company stamp on the top of the burger. Oh, yeah. We have a Maple Family Center stamp. Very so cool. We're, yeah. We're, we're not ashamed to copy something to the good. <laughs> hey, it works. Yeah. I, I watched one go by. I didn't eat it. but I. So we're putting emphasis on that. We And how do, what happens? Hey, hey you're going to hit 30 and you're going to want your party. And that's a great piece of business. 30 couples, good food, liquor sales to go with it. So it's really an eye on marketing and who are our customers. Mm -hmm. One thing, maybe you could figure this out. I walked into one of the Florida locations, middle of the day. There were a bunch of guys drinking a lot of beer, having a great time. And there were stacks of pamper diapers on the concourse. Yeah. What was it? The girls had their, the wives had their baby shower and the men had their baby shower. Interesting. Yeah. And I'm saying, How can I make that happen again? Right. <laughs> I've only seen it twice, but I really like, I like that. It's like, great. Right. How do you let people know that? And you have to probably, I don't know where you start. You could partner with the pampers. That's the start. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's. So my mind works like, how do we make that happen? Right. Years ago, there were a group of people early in the morning on lanes one and two, and they were there for two or three Fridays in a row. And I got to meet them. And in those days, it was not computerized. There was a department that worked midnight to eight to clear checks for Chemical Bank. By the time I got, rid of, got done with them, they had 14 teams every Friday morning. The mm -hmm. bar was open for happy hour at 8, 8 a.m. The business begets business. So that we had 14 teams of four and a bunch of postmen came in. And by the next year, there was a second league at the same time. It's really what's kept me, what's kept me good, my set of eyes and my understanding that if people are trying to create a habit, I could help them along. Mm -hmm. And their comment to me was, Bowling is the only normal thing we do all week. When you work midnight to eight, nothing is normal. Right. We don't have that anymore. That's long gone. But yeah, there's the next one. It might be Pampers. It might be something else. Right. I don't know. I don't know. You might know. <laughs> no, but, I love that a lot. It's going with the human nature, going with the grain of what people are trying to do. And you're just trying to stoke that and spread it to other people. You got I it. I love that. Yeah, I love that. What about the gaming side? Is that something you guys have been yeah, pushing? I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. We're just almost done with the physical plant for the second arcade. We okay. have a redemption center. There's a science to it. I'm smart enough to know what I don't know. So George McAuliffe is a consultant, not a commercial for him, but he's a really good guy. He's done the first one for us. Now he's doing the second one for us. I don't know what game is better than the other, though I go, yeah. to, go to Ubig and they discuss it. And I, it's just not what I do. So, so uh, I listen and I say to my grandkids, what games do you like? <laughs> right. <laughs> because the arcades are in Florida. They're not in New York yet where the grandkids are. So yeah, I don't have those free consultants. You're still learning. Right. Yeah, I mean, I talked to guys like Mike Logan or Brian Smith, and they're all about the games. That's they've been preaching that for a long they do time. They a great job, and I'm just not there yet. Mm -hmm. We don't have VIP rooms. We don't have those nuances that a lot of the big places, the fun time places, and all that. But I learn from them. I admire everything they do because I see that's where it's going. Yeah, we've never taken lanes out right now. Yeah, that's my next question. But it's square footage and it's real estate and you want to get a return mm -hmm. on investment for your real estate. Right. We have a built a bowling center, which we've never done. My dad did way back when, but I'm a chicken. I could take a beat up one and make it better, but I yeah. can't, I'm not a pioneer. We would never build a 40 lane bowling center. You'd build a 20 lane bowling, 16 lane bowling center, big bar, big arcade, all the other amenities. If I can get my wife to say we could do the gun thing with a, the, not only the escape room, the with, with, uh, whatever the other thing's called, we, we would do it, but we're not there. We're not for that. Yeah. And yeah, depending on space is always the limiting factor. We have 
30 and 40 and 50,000 square foot buildings. So you, you can right. figure out. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like the arcade. So we have a, a Facebook group and we polled some of the people in the group of what they're most profitable on a per square foot basis. A product line is, and a lot of people said the so, arcade. So we have a very traditional bowling center in Clearwater. We do, everyone is amazed at how much league business we do, which is about $400,000. All right. The arcade did about 340. All mm -hmm. the effort we put into league bowling, with if we put the same effort in, we would do tremendously better. Right. It's free money. I mean, it's easy. Mm -hmm. right. But if, if we challenge ourselves to make it harder and do more promotions for it, and we do some discounted hours and we give people the cards and we, we juice it up a little bit, better at it. And then yeah. traditional that places, open play is two and a half times more than that when it comes to revenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so all in all, and this is all about 22 being very good. It's all good. You, you don't want to give up any of it. You want to grow it all. Yeah. There, there's some conflict. Weekends will be in conflict. We, we were at loggerheads with a Friday night league that was bleeding into our cosmic time. And we ultimately convinced them to go to threes from four, start a little earlier, get out earlier. Their league grew. I don't care how big it is early. Yeah. Right. So there, we took some heat and, sure. it, and a good leader is comfortable in uh, with himself when he makes a tough decision and you got to take all the, you know, I got to take the heat. I know how to right. do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you've had a lot of practice over the years with some league bowlers. My, my first week there, we lost someone's bowling ball in 1971. We had lockers in the basement and we moved them up and we lost some guy's bowling ball. He was a tough union guy, cigar, bald head. He chewed me out. And he was with the second chemical bank league that bowled with us at 6 p.m. And as a result of us screwing up, he and I became great friends. Mm -hmm. And what did he do? He ran the motor pool for chemical bank with all the armored cars. He oh, would wow. send the armored truck to Maple Lanes and drop off cases of quarter wrappers for me. Oh, wow. It's just almost a 60-year memory. Yeah. Well, some odd year memory, but it's mm -hmm. like, how do you grow flowers from manure? Right. <laughs> turn it, yeah, turn it into a, a, love, a love friendship. I love that. One thing I wanted to ask you a little bit about, and I don't know if this is something where it's convenience for you or where you see business going, is having the centers in Florida. So I know you have a couple in New York, right? And two in yeah, Florida, three, I believe. Two in, two in Florida. Yeah. So what's, is that a matter of convenience uh, being down in Florida or you just see opportunity there? Tell me a little bit about that. I was a young 65 and bought the first one. Mm -hmm. I thought it was great. And that came after us selling the, the original bowling center in Brooklyn. And God bless Uncle Sam with the 1031 tax code yeah. real estate swap. James. I really couldn't find anything in New York, but and I, you could get a 1031 and be a passive owner, I still wanted to be in the bowling business. And uh, the truth is we were at a family reunion that went too many days in the East coast of Florida. And I called Dave, Dave Driscoll, the broker and said, get me out of here. And you know what? <laughs> I own the place in Clearwater. You know? Wow. Was, That's awesome. Now, let me tell you about the place. It had good bones and nothing else. It had good location <laughs> on the main road, broken down. No one got paid dirty. And I knew I could fix it. As, and this is a good story. I took a tour of the place. The restrooms were disgusting. But I go behind the machines, and it was like an operating room. And I go around. There's a rolling cart with a towel and tools, just like a doctor would bring. Think of the dentist tray. They are right. the thing. Yeah. We promoted that man today to be the supervisor of both bowling centers. He was the head mechanic. Uh, yeah by the hour 10 years ago and now he leads the team in florida wow and it's all about nurturing getting a good response challenging getting a better response <laughs> a few tears a few a little bit of angst and and if that set of that pit area wasn't like an operating room this is his first day on his job right it's kind of cool yeah and when we what we do is we take every mechanic and we make them facility managers. So you worry about the roof, you worry about the drains, you worry about the bathroom, you worry about the cleanliness. Smart. So 
we took the cleaning away from the woman who was the shift manager. And she burst into tears. How can you take this away from me? I said, let me take you in the, late, in the men's room where I've been complaining every time I've been here and you didn't yeah. do it. Yeah. So we've been rich. We've been poor. But we always had soap and water and somebody to clean. Right. I like that. So then, yeah. So yeah. could you expand a little bit on some of the things for finding talent? Because I think it's tough to find talent these days, but if you can find it within or promote or nurture someone, that's a huge asset. Loyalty first, loyalty and all the other stuff. Yeah. Someone said, we have to honor someone who's honest. And I'm saying to myself, my father would say to me, aren't you supposed to be honest? <laughs> Is that like something special? Right. <laughs> so, so you want you want to have someone who has good values in themselves, right? And that, and then you want to take them up and help them along. That's, I look around at all the centers. Like I told you, the payroll percentages are high, but sure. low. Yeah, so better than the other way around. The bigger companies will have three or four full-timers. We might have 10 or 12 in each place. And that way, when you come to bowl every Monday, the same faces are there. And that's important to me. And so if people get value, they don't care about price. You probably could yeah. price yourself out, but we never do that. But we always try to give value. So we try to be always clean. We try to be always consistent. We're, and it's funny, you put you raise the standards. The, last week, the air conditioning went out twice in one place and we, in Florida. And here we are the professing all this and the damn thing broke. <laughs> I don't know how it broke. Yeah. So you, you try to always keep the standard up. And every once in a while, you can't do it. And right. you fall on your sword. sword you just, you just, so, so the buying people who care. But I think you could always teach skill if they have an aptitude for it, depending on the job. I couldn't be a mechanic. You could that wouldn't be what I could do. But I'll I'll I could sweep and I could lead by example, which is what I was always taught. So mm -hmm. so I will bend down slowly and pick up that straw wrapper and look the kid in the eye and say to him, this is the enemy. This guy's <laughs> crazy. Some of them get it, some of them don't. But yeah, that's sort of my job lately. Though. Right, yeah. instilling the values. Yeah, and we're very, we're just very fortunate. The bowling center in Rockville Center was in the town I raised, my wife and I raised our kids in. It was traditionally a non-member center. There were two guys that ran it. They didn't get along well with each other. My dad, who passed away in 1982, was with me when we tried to buy it in the late 70s. And all of a sudden... We owned it in 2009, and I was coaching my son's and daughter's bowling league there in the in their 40s, so how long could that be? 30-some-odd years ago. I had to bring two cases of light balls because the bowling center wouldn't provide them, and we scribed it for the youth league that, that had it, and I befriended the mechanic who I honestly tried to steal. The joke is we have two jokes. I had to buy the place to get him, and that he's four days younger than me. He could retire four days after I do. This September, he starts his 50th year in that bowling center. Really? And wow. I mean, that's now I can't get an email. I could get those all 34 of those A2s. They're like all his mm -hmm. drawings. Yeah, clockwork. He knows every they're in and everything. Wow. So it's about, from my point of view, it's always about people on both sides of the Right. Counter. It's always about people. And if, if you connect with them for a short period of time or a long period of time, we're big on touching the tables, which is a restaurant thing. Right. So you're here on a, I don't care what night, if you're an avid league bowler or if you're there on a, a cheap special with your girlfriend, I want somebody to go over and make sure you're having a good time, make sure everything's okay. If either one of them keeps putting the ball in the gutter, I will say to them, can I give you a pointer? Say, sure. I say, or I'll say, want to knock more pins down? Because I don't care what kind of bowler you are. You're a once-a-year bowler with your buddies. You want to beat those guys. Of course. So I'll tell them about your foot is the sight of the rifle. So if your foot is straight at the foul line, the ball is more likely to go in the middle. But if you go this way, it goes that way. And so then they get six instead of two, and I'm a mm -hmm. hero. Right. Yeah. They're asking you to come back. You don't get that in the Wharton school. Right. <laughs> right. You apply it. Yeah. I can't begin to tell you 
how many walls are built between the counter, the control counter, and the bowling lanes. And people feel that they have to be locked in at the desk and they can't. Right. So that's one of my things. You can leave the desk for two minutes, put something yeah. else. Get them out on the concourse. Go make sure that they'll tell you what they want to buy. I was a mutual Omaha salesman in my first job. And okay. I bought many things, right? Customer will tell you what he wants to buy and when he wants to buy it. Right. He'll also, there's also an expression we use that the first one to speak loses. So if, would you like to join a league Tuesday or would Thursday be better or whatever you want to do? Right. So, so you see, yeah, equipping your people to be out there and promoting the center all the time, reselling, so to speak. Enforcing the brand. That's all you're doing. Right. Yeah. Like you said, it's all about people and they're the ones out there who have that ability for your center. And we have some with profound skills, but some of them aren't people skills. We try to put them where they belong. Yeah. Do you do any kind of training or anything special for that or just through teach you by example? We rely on BPA for all the stuff they do. And I've lived through the growth of BPA from being a good old boys club. As I was coming up, the president of BPA, I was either sergeant at arms or like the lowest guy down. I want you to find someone who could talk about marketing. So I go and find somebody in Connecticut. He was a sports marketer. And I go to the executive director, who was this grand old guy, and I go, Chief, I have a guy. He'll speak for 45 minutes. It's a thousand bucks. This is like 1979 or whatever. Does that include his airfare? <laughs> and that's where it was. Right. All the online stuff. It makes me very, I'm, I'm so proud of BPA. Yeah. For so many reasons. I don't think it's been an easy road for me. I, would, I, I could quarrel with any one of them about anything, but we still got to dinner tough but it's all about the process and what should our priorities be and all the education and the buying program and then the marketing some of the marketing stuff i am the first time we were at the macy's thanksgiving day parade i rented a room at the at a hotel on 50 for the warwick hotel on 56 and I watch those balloonicles with my entire family march down 6th Avenue. Oh, that's awesome. That's, that's like a dream for me. Right. They're your people. And it was like great. Yeah. And seeing the buying program, which I was around long enough to know where all that started. It, it, it started with a strategic plan in 1986. And the most brilliant bowling person to this day is Wally Hall. Wally Hall was the chairman of Fairlane, did go to the Wharton School, British man, dynamic, had us do strategic planning. And the strategic plan of 1986 called for a buying program, called for a merge men and women's association, called for a soft drink program, called for a lot of things that were just pie in the sky. If you rule the world, what would you want? And many of them came true. And what's going right. on today is the result of plan. Right. So we had, I had lunch with Kevin Krause. We're nearby in Florida. And I said to him, go find that strategic plan and do it again. Because we don't yeah. know what the future will be like. And just look ahead and put it on the wall and throw darts at it. And, because the, the only constant is change. It's the only thing that, you know the only thing you know and right and if you never stop able to manage change embrace change and implement some of it i think you succeed yeah absolutely because like you said that's the only thing you can really count on is that it won't be the same speaking of which it's a great segue thank you for the segue into last question is we rehearse this right <laughs> exactly right <laughs> that was perfect because that's my last question for you is where do you see things changing now where where do you see things going in the next call it 12 12 months or so maybe 18 it's i think change takes longer than that it's much more cyclical i think in the long run there'll be more things going on in a bowling center and we have escape rooms and all the other stuff and we have this great big piece of property in lakeland florida where the bowling center is and i we said should we put a miniature golf course out there and then someone else said should we put a should we put car wash should we put uh, 
volleyball? What should we, we haven't done anything, but we know that we should have other avenues of revenue. And what I thought of thinking, living through COVID, I felt that there would be a great boom of philosophical changes. People would come up with creative things as a result of that. Thank you. I, I, though I can't cite it, some of the bigger companies that are in Mubik, Stars and Strikes, and all those big guys, they're doing a great job of bringing in people, letting them enjoy bowling. Different than my Monday night five-man league. Yeah. Right, uh, but enjoying it nonetheless. Uh, so, so I, what do I see? I see recreational bowling. If it continues, it'll be a boom. It'll be people going four times a year with a higher ticket price and yeah. not worried. There's a two dollars or nine dollars. But I see those changes happening. I also see the guys who can't change going away. So globally, and this is not a twelve month thing. Yes, yeah. the survival of the fittest. And those who keep it clean, keep it friendly, keep it professional, will succeed and they'll keep doing well. And there right. are many who do, including the big guys. You, you, you can't escape from saying, my God, the one thing in our strategic plan that we did talk about in the 80s was only the television rights. And look who has the television rights, mm -hmm. right? That's a pretty powerful tool. And my hat's off to Tom Shannon for his wisdom and all those things. Yeah. But I'm good at what I do and I'm different. I offer a different kind of uh, business model, if you call it that. I'm not going to give up on league bowling. I'm not going to give up on the sport. You, you may or may not know that a year and a half ago, we hired Amaletto Monticelli, who's a 20-time PBA winner, my employee, and he runs our... Department of Skill Improvement. Very cool. Yeah. So, so I I'm applied about that. Code, right. One K health benefits to this wonderful, nice, great guy who I've known since the day he started. In those days, kiss me on both cheeks. Now I say it's in the handbook. It can't kiss me. <laughs> but it's all about if you take our traditional sense, right? If people improve their skill, they'll buy more games. So skill improvement equates to more paid games. Yes. There's some self-interest, but one, I love having him under our roof and there is some cost to it, but I have people who are thanking me for it. We bring them to New York twice a year. Every hour session is booked. Yeah. People, he's charming. First of all, he has this nice accent. You got to listen a little harder, but he's very good at making you throw that ball better the next shot than you did the last shot. Yeah. So so I'm all over the place, right? I care about the future. I care about all this, but I also care about the sport. Right. And, you know, because that's who brought us here. Doesn't mean that I'm not going to do two and a half times open play, three times open play. Doesn't mean I'm not going to modify my Friday and Saturday night level of business. I don't know too many parties that'll go on Wednesday at 530. Right. There'll be some, but I don't, I'm not... Our demographics don't allow that. Maybe if I was still in Brooklyn, I could get that done. But right, no. yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah, it's a balancing act, and I think when you can get both sides to realize that, then that's when you really have that harmony. Is that's sort of where we are. We're like, think of that song, "Both Sides Now," right? And <laughs> we enjoy parts of the catering side, parts of the recreational side, and the skill side. Yeah. So last question I had about that skill side, is that something where they have to book a appointment with him or is that provided for them to try to increase their skill or how does that work? I mean, we've kind of, we just had this idea and we let it take a life of its own. It's now become four or five or six lessons a day. We do some group things. We have them involved in the youth programs in Florida. We, we see it, if we could create league programs that use him Tournaments that could use him. I beat, I beat Amuleto. You know what Amuleto means? Means no. ha means tablet on the lanes. He's yeah. a ch charming, good guy. And so, so here we are. We're pushing that. But how else could we use him? We do some group lessons, and we're he's taking over our pro shops as we speak. So there'll be a whole Amuleto Maple Family Center relationship as time goes on. Yeah. 
Very cool. I, I like that as a concept. A salute to the sport. That's but yeah, that's a perfect. Those guys with those boxes of Pampers, one of them wanted <laughs> yeah. to beat the other. Took that out with Amuleto, he would have ripped them. Right. <laughs> exactly. They would have been going down to meet with them to get a few pins extra. I love that. I know we're coming up to the top of the hour. I want to be respectful of your time. And I know you came on here under one stipulation that you could share a cause that's near and dear to your heart. So let's dive into that a little bit. So, so the Bowlers to Veterans Link is more than 80 years old. And let's think about our core values, right? We spent some time on that. I know that giving is good business. I know that when a company subscribes to a higher set of values than just profit comes, and yes. BBL fits in our company like a hand in a glove. Have you watched the commercials for Mike's, the hero, I think it's Mike's, where they give away a day's worth of profit to charities? Have you, that, that, there's a good company, I, and I should have done a little research before I went on. I didn't think we'd talk about it. But I was so impressed that this man with uh, 2,000 stores is giving away money that goes into local communities, food banks, or touches things. He does that for us. And I've always, since I'm like, you know, the two people that don't know me should know that I've spent 55 years involved in everything. Because when I came aboard, there was no education at BPAA. You had to learn from others. Is what BPA offered me. And then I got involved with YABA, the youth thing, which was with all the other organizations. And then I learned about BVL. And I knew that there was a woman named Helen Duval who taught bowling to veterans. And I knew that Johnny Petraglia, my longtime friend, was a veteran and did things for BVL. And I always supported it to a small degree. As time went on, and I told you about Maple Lanes being on the Verrazano side of Brooklyn. When 9-11 came, those ashes fell on the top of our roof. Those wow. papers came down. And I said to my son, who was working part-time, and I was worried about him because he was working at Rockefeller Center then. Mm. And I said, get out of there. I don't, where else would they go? That's, he walked to Harlem and all. I went to a number of funerals where nobody was there. No no person who lost their lives were there. And I just felt that we needed to be a more meaningful member of our community. And that's when we embraced BBL. It took some years to come to fruition. We started running in-house tournaments. The prize would be a visit to Bowl Expo where you give the check. And year one, no one ever raised this kind of money for BBL. Joe called me and said, I just did the math. I think we raised $25,000. And wow. way back when there was a tournament called the Miller Doubles, it came from each bowling center and BPA would promote it. You put up five bucks for game two. And if you bowled well, you made the cut and you keep going to see if you could win it. We use that same format. Okay. And in New York, we'll have a, we'll have a, an event and in Florida, we'll have an event. And then we tie in the PBA 50 event that's in our bowling centers this year in August. And it's to benefit BVL. Last year, we gave 70 some odd thousand dollars to BVL. Wow. Wow. Of the million 250,000 that's raised, because we keep beating the drum, all of us. I get some credit for it, but I'm just the band leader as the chairman right. of it. But, you know, you go to the, you go to the Veterans Day ceremonies in Washington, D.C., and the Red Cross is there, and this organization, and that organization, and Korean War veterans, and American War veterans, and Bowlers to Veterans Link. There's no other that does what we do, mm -hmm. to the degree that we've done, right? for the amount of time that we've done. And one visit, I was invited to the White House, and in the White House... I met a man who happened to be the secretary of the VA, said to me, I don't, I'm amazed that bowling raised a million bucks. How do you do it? And I said, a dollar at a time, and we all help. And he said, I was chairman of Procter & Gamble. I know the guys on the Brunswick board. I can't believe it. What could I do for you? I said, you can come to my convention. It's Bowl Expo. Blah. He showed up. Wow. He made a speech. 
yeah. he told our members that BVL is a year older than the VA itself. Wow. And that we've been doing things that they should be doing for a long time. And we provide money for non-budgeted recreational services, right. therapeutic recreational services. And that's what we do. Yeah. If your company wants to embrace something of greater importance than simple profit in the bowling industry, look to BVL and okay. we'll give you the tools. We'll give you all the tools to make your customers like you more, respect you more and show up more. It's a win for everybody. That's it. Love that. Yeah, I know. Certainly be interested in something like that. And then for anyone else who's watching, who wants to be more involved, where should they go? Or what's the best way to get involved? BVL.org. Call me up 516-448-0584. Wow. Everyone has my cell phone. Look at that. Rockwell Center, Maple Lanes Rockwell Center, 516-678-3010. Or BVL.org. Ask for Mary. I mean, it's we're all here. We have a nice board of all sorts of people from all the industry. represents the entire industry. And... We just want to raise a dollar more than last year. Yeah, I'm sure you will. I mean, just hearing some of the things you guys are doing, there's no doubt in my mind you will. We actually, we did two cool things. We we pay, we funded 50 state veterans homes and fitted them with virtual reality systems, which are goggles and a way to deliver therapy, especially to older people that, yeah. that gets results, you know, right? So if you if the therapist says grab this bar and the older person can't do it, but you have the goggles in and say, would you get those butterflies? And there they are doing the therapy or taking off on an aircraft carrier that they did 60 years ago. To yeah. Get some peace. And the second thing we did was through the vet centers, which are local walk-in clinics. We did many things with them. But we hosted a buffalo run between two states that veterans on horses did. Okay. So our goal is to brighten veterans' lives. And we do that because we're free because they paid a price. Absolutely. You're doing what you're doing because they paid that price. So am I. Yeah. And my job is to get everyone to step up a little bit. Give a little bit back. That's it. I love that. I love that. Awesome. Yeah, I really appreciate that, John. And for anyone listening, it's absolutely. Continued success. I'm yeah, sure. likewise. Yeah, I really appreciate that. It means a lot coming from a guy like yourself. Yeah, uh, this might have kept me fresh. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This has been awesome. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy guy, and I'm sure we could go on for another hour easily. Call me anytime. Yeah, but uh, thank you again, John, and looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you.